Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another tonic discussion. Uh, today in the house is Daniel, Mark, John, and myself. And today we're going to talk about uh, contrarianism and when it can, when and how it can go wrong, basically, right? So it's uh, we all read two articles, one by me and one by John. Um, mine is called um, "How to." become an awake contrarian and john's uh, article is mimetic judo biopolitics and exopolitics so to just give a brief intro before i open the floor so the the basic uh, idea here is you know like um how to uh have a free will and think for yourself you know even as a contrarian even if you don't buy like the the mainstream narratives and and go against the grain how do you avoid the trap of just you know like reacting basically a fall into the the other um extreme whenever someone's uh, from the mainstream says something you immediately you know switch and and uh, take the opposite view uh, because that's a very reactive state to be in right so it by definition it you don't have a lot of free will if you just react to external stimuli uh, that's just how it is right um, so there's a trap uh, there that we we want to talk about uh, and maybe to give one example that I gave in my article uh, you, you know that a lot of the what later like um, became sort of the basis for Vogue ideology um, started in Germany, where else? Um, and uh, the the background here is that obviously after World War II in Germany, they there were like a lot of Nazis uh, still around. So today, if you if you hear the you know the, the this thing that you know like the the leftists they they see a Nazi behind every bush, you know, and every everywhere are Nazis uh that's obviously like crazy but uh you know in germany at the time obviously there were was a lot of truth to that right so my my dad for example um he had like literal nazi teachers you know there were like nazis on the street you know like who made comments to you you know when you when you maybe your hair wasn't uh, like super short then they would say like oh yeah if if adolf was still around he would would have thrown you you know like into a concentration camp or whatever i mean that that sort of thing so so it was an issue and obviously, like the contrarians at the time, right, they reacted to that, too. And they thought, OK, screw you guys. We, we want to do our own thing. You know, we don't believe that crap and uh, let's do something else. And that's partly how the whole 68 movement arose in Germany and France. Um, and again, that is like a, a very much the basis for like today's uh, leftist ideas um, and uh, uh, just uh, as an example, Herbert Marcuse of uh, Frankfurt School fame, uh, he resonated deeply with with the contrarians at the time, right? Because he uh, basically said, uh, yeah, there's this massive consumerism um, that's rampant. People are just uh, stupid and, and just are turned into these mindless consumers and and the young people at the time they 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 resonated with that they saw it right they, the tv ca came came along advertising all of that and they hated it you know um and they hated that culture and and they obviously had intellectual heroes like the frankfurt school guys you know who just said the right things and um uh, but also mixed in some like not so right things right so that's always the danger and and so in that sense they kind of fell if you will in in a trap of the, the same trap that we're talking today uh, talking about today um i.e uh, just um being reactive and flipping to the opposite and and maybe being even right about many of those things right but then um mixing it with uh, with ideology with the uh, thoughts that might later you know turn into like something very ugly and uh, and maybe we're we're at, at we have we face the same danger right so maybe today uh, we see all the crap that is going on um and so we react to it you know and and that there's a certain we are obviously like justified in doing so but there's the danger of like losing your way basically by the mere reactiveness of uh of your state of mind um and uh, john in his article he gave the example of the whole COVID fiasco right so uh if you people might not remember uh in the early days uh it was basically the right wing that totally went nuts over over this virus right i mean because the, the the mainstream basically said don't worry you know that's just crazy china 
Um, they, they just overreacting and uh, there's nothing to worry about. And then the right wing, I remember that like even in Germany, the, the right wing party, you know, the AFD, and it was the same. I think everywhere was like, oh no, that's cr it's a crazy virus. It will kill us all. And we need to close the borders, close all the borders, you know, and they, they kind of mixed it, you know, with their other like, politics you know about immigration and stuff you know which had didn't have anything to do with that right so they just you know like oh yeah close the borders you know so just the this super reactive state you know where you basically don't think just react and and that's obviously like turned out to not age very well to say the least um so yeah with that um let's open the floor like how, how can we avoid that trap guys the funny thing is when i wrote that article i just wanted an excuse to run the aliens in UFOs, <laughs> <laughs> but um, because that was my second example was how I was seeing like you know the whole topic of like you know UFOs how for generations that's been uh you know conspiracy stuff right and but just the last couple of years but especially the last, especially this year uh with the, the congressional hearings and so on you have this kind of like tacit <laughs> tacit admission by elements inside the power structure that like oh there could be something real here and then the contrarian uh side of things online like immediately just switch to like aliens are fake like there's 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 this is all a side you know and that's, which you know it's kind of very similar with like the, the switch that happened with covid um and you actually did see you know people in the aftermath of the lockdowns uh in the sort of conspiracy here um starting to push the idea that viruses don't exist like not just that covid was a sign off but like viruses themselves completely made up right uh to just going as hard as they possibly could in the opposite direction um when you know to me it seems pretty obvious that like yeah okay you know virus okay viruses are real guys like i don't know what to tell you uh covid 19 certainly was a real virus it was simply exaggerated in its effects and like yes there was a sign the sign wasn't a virus you know the, the truth really in this case really was somewhere in between um which yeah i mean when this kind of like reactive mentality when you just reflexively take the opposite of whatever uh your perceived opponent is saying you're not like you're it, you're you're every bit as controlled in that case as if you reflexively take the same position that power is saying, right? So then, if you know, to, to, for power to decide, like to to sort of uh, guide the culture, they, they can. If everyone is being reactive in one way or the other, uh, then okay, like they, the powerful will say something, and. Then they'll know. Okay, this segment of the population will simply believe whatever they're told and do what they're told. Great, and that's the direction we want them to. Be. But this, you know, this other section of the population will just like instinctively do the opposite. But since we know they'll do that, we can also kind of plan for that and uh, maybe even get a strategic benefit from. It. Um, so, in to go back to the COVID thing, the, the, one of the points I was trying to make was that by going by the media going really hard in on it's just the flu bro for the first two months of, or three months of 2020 uh first two months i guess um that kind of sigh off to the right into going really hard in the other direction of like this is the end of the world it's the apocalypse right uh and then when the lockdowns hit you just had total chaos on the right it was just this utter shit show because you, you had a whole bunch of them that had really gone in all in on covid is bad and now that suddenly the power structure had changed its um its position on that they they sort of couldn't switch on a dime themselves without looking kind of stupid so they were still continuing to push in the direction of like no this is something we have to worry about and the lockdowns are a good thing everything and then you had you know others who were sort of saying this looks kind of fake um why are we doing this here or anything why are we believing these people and it and it, it just basically for several months it is it completely neutralized 
the mimetic efficacy of any sort of uh, resistance to the lockdowns, um, which I, I kind of wonder, was that like a planned, was that a, a deliberate move, you know, because like they knew that, that it's not like the, 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 the power structure didn't know that it has this kind of like online, increasingly influential dissident resistance to everything that it's trying to do. And you know, if they were clever, then they would figure out ways to kind of, you know, neutralize that uh, or even use it to their advantage. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could I jump like, in here for a second? Yeah, I, I think ahead, that, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things on the table here. Um, I, I, the one trap, I think, is also something that we need to avoid, which is to... Um, purely model something as reactive um, when we when it could be the result of more information. So in other words, as we're tracking, trying to track like as best as we can in real time, um, uh, this this very complex field of um, information surrounding something like COVID, let's say. Um, and so early on, like, yes, I'm sure that a lot of it was reactive. I'm sure on both sides, it was reactive. And they had one side that was shouting to the rooftops that this was no big deal. That was initially the left who were out of power, where the right was saying, well, you know, bat in the hatches, boys, this is the big one. Um, and then, of course, they flipped sides. And we could say from a distance, we could say, like, well, that's pure reactive um, uh, reactivity on both sides. But, you know, just from my own perspective, like seeing um, uh, boots on the ground, let's say during the summer of love, during the summer of George Floyd, I think that for a lot of people, myself included, like it was just sort of like, okay, I got to go a level deeper with this. Something else is going on, here. particularly when the CDC is coming out with stuff like, well, you know, uh, uh, systemic racism is an even bigger virus and even bigger public health emergency. So go ahead and go out in the streets and run around and loot and, and, uh, and burn. Um, and so like, I think that, that, again, that was more information that was added into the mix. So a lot of people, like, I think, I think there were many people that, and, and this is, I wanted to approach this from the idea of epistemic humility. Um, so early on, it's just sort of like you, you're on a, you're on a very foggy battlefield. You don't have any idea really what's going on. You're hearing all different kinds of shouts and murmurs from every media microphone that's saying one one side saying this, one side saying that. Um, and then there are a lot of people, I think, that, you know, kind of held, you know, kept their powder dry, but sort of held their fire until they had more information. And I think that my wife and I were particularly in that group where we're just sort of like, we don't really know what's going on quite yet. We need to wait and see. We need to see how the movements are happening like across this strange foggy battlefield um and 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 gradually came to the conclusion okay so there is something else going on here there are incentives that are becoming very obvious um there are lies that are that are becoming very obvious and so like that's that's its own sort of like reactivity i think like in a strange way it's a meta reactivity where you say like oh well people are all sheep and they're just sort of um pushed one way or the other across the battlefield they're all pawns of psyops um which is you know again i i think is like another danger like that we we diminish people to that degree and don't take into account that many people are we're waiting and seeing many people uh will be waiting and seeing and they don't have voices necessarily we only hear the megaphones we only hear um in many cases social media which again is like a weird battlefield of its own that may include Psy operatives may include bots or does include those things. Uh, very un hard to untangle signal from noise, particularly early on in any event, including ones that are engineered, including ones that or are taken advantage of, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of like not letting a crisis go to waste, go and grab more power. You know, I think like as time moves along, as the timeline moves along, you do get more information. And it doesn't mean that you're going to exactly know what's going on. And that's kind of what I mean by epistemic humility. It's sort of like it means that you're gradually in any domain, you're going to, if you, if you relax and if you step back and if you say, let me look at this a little bit more dispassionately, 
let me look at this from a, a, a sort of a, a, a higher point of view um, without, without again, reacting, which is, you know, we're all, we're all our active and reactive beings. But if you could get to that place, I think, I think you'll see that like, you know, the people that were shouting early on, um, most of them were just heavily incentivized to do so. And everybody else was just kind of lost in a fog. And so gradually, and I think this would happen, this, this ties into what John was talking about with UFOs as well. It's sort of like, you know, there are going to be people that, again, um, the opposite of epistemic humility would be something like, you know, epistemic hubris. You know, like I know things that I can't possibly know. Something along those lines, you know, which we saw all over the map during the COVID uh, uh, situation. We saw people that were making wild claims about things that they can't possibly know and, you know, retelling them as truths of some sort. And I think if the, you know, similar things, you know, might be happening. And, and sorry, and, John. And, yeah. And, and like, and on both sides. I think that's really important. On both sides, yeah. Like, like, yeah, I mean, on both sides. Have, like, you know, on all sides. Like, oh, if we know for sure this is going to kill everyone, like the, you know, the virus, or we know for Absolutely. sure that like, yeah. the, the, the vaccine is going to provide like p- perfect protection and it's totally safe, you know. But on the other side, you had, you know, the, the Stu Peters of this world being like, you know, this is gonna, 90% of the population is going to die. It's the death shot, you know. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, that didn't happen yeah. either. And they're, exactly. you know? and they're incentivized <laughs> to do so. They're incentivized to do so. Uh, multiple oh, uh, multiple right. dimensions. Epistemic, epistemic humility does not does not drive engagement on uh, right. social media platforms. Or, you know, it's the, or, you know it, it, like, frankly, the media has always been like that, too, right? I mean, Especially once he said to have like mass electronic media. I mean, like television was not exactly a medium that gave itself to the nuance, uh, which was one of the early um, uh, critiques of television. Actually, it was, it was dumbing everything down. Right? You, epistemic humility is kind of a, a, an intrinsically, I don't want to say like a high IQ way of looking at things, but there's a certain sort of sophistication to it where you have to be willing to take your time to think things through and not just kind of like jump to conclusions. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't I actually don't think it has anything to do with IQ or any sort no, of like no, uh, no, measure no, of that's, intelligence. That's, yeah, that's why I didn't want to say intelligence exactly, but like there is, um, it's, it's a more, it's like more highbrow almost to take your time to think things through, which is why I, I do think like a return to like more long form, uh content um so like you know the modern internet yeah we're all the last last couple years you know you have like essayists on substack who are you know writing up long think pieces and then you also but you also have like on youtube and the other streaming platforms you have these like you know three hour conversations between people or like you know podcasts where there's actually time to like you know think things through and be a little bit more careful of what you say and you know, not just to do sound bites and, you know, like tweets and such, right? Because um, slogans, like, slogan, slogans, like slogans, slogans, like yes, boiling exactly, things exactly. down, you know, like like safe and effective, safe and effective, right. safe and effective, safe and effective. That, that, you that just hammer works, that, those, it, yeah. it, that works really well on like, in like a tweet, you know, or, uh, or, or a sound clip on like CNN, but um, it doesn't work as well in like a long, nuanced conversation so yeah. what, what i'm kind of saying is that like you know maybe as at least parts of the internet start to or part of elements of the culture sort of like move back towards longer more nuanced forms of communication like that will maybe encourage a little bit more epistemic humor because like one thing that i do i do notice on substack is that the people sort of screaming to the high heavens making you know, wild attention grabbing claims and such, like, don't necessarily do as well as they would have. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think that ties into like this whole like shit show on social media, right? Um, and that I- in this day and age, we really need to be careful um, and need to take a step back, basically, whenever there's a new, the new thing, right? Um, just uh, as you guys said, you know, take, take your time, you know, think think through and uh, also one aspect i think is uh, i wrote about it at some point you know like when common sense 
Trump's signs, you know, was was an article I wrote, uh, you know, with the COVID thing also um, in mind, you know, you, you kind of need to get back to your own experience at some point, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, with the COVID thing, you know, like at some point, you just, you know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I still don't know anybody who who died of COVID. You know, I, I knew, know of someone like three three friends removed, you know, that's all. And uh, so at some point like that, that should give you a clue, right? Um, same thing for the Vax, you know, I mean, um, I don't know anybody who died from the Vax either. I mean, I, mean, I knew, know someone, it's not true. I know someone. Who's, I was uh, just where, about to say, yeah. like also for the Vax, like I don't, yeah, I don't no, I, I know it. anyone that you can definitely say, oh, it was the Vax. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I, I retract that he hereby. You know, I, I know actually like- You, you can also say people. the same thing about COVID. Do you do you know that somebody died of COVID or with COVID? No, no that's what I meant, uh, right? Know. I mean, that from I don't know anybody, right, who clearly died from, from COVID, but I knew no people who, who I'm pretty sure died from the Vax, but- I also know as many as as you guys, I'm sure know too, like hundreds of people who seem fine, you know, like after the vax. So and and th this this kind of thing should should give you clues, you know, that when someone comes along and says, oh, they're wiping out ninety percent of the population, you know, why are the vax? You know, I mean, um, that that might be hyperbole, but that also there is some might be something to it you know that it's dangerous and that might even kill a lot of people down the line you know i'm not uh, saying it doesn't but just what i'm what i'm getting at is like um to really uh try to see what you can see with your own eyes you know the same probably is true like you know for the whole like gender wars right because there's like um this whole hype ball like on all sides you know about like the the relationship between men and women and I, I guess, especially if you are young, you know, like you just don't have that much experience, but at some point you just, you know, like have to uh, look with your own eyes, you know, see a bit like what, what your experience is telling you as well, you know, and at least factor that in, you know, before you subscribe to to some hot take, you know, like whatever the, the political stance, you know, and, and, and so that's, I think, in, in addition to like sitting back and like giving things more thought, you know, and, and not jumping to conclusions, uh, is is super important to um yeah just open your eyes to the to the real world and to your own experience and just uh, take that into account as well. Right? Can we can we start referring to social media as the hyper bowl now? You know, an analogy to the Rose Bowl or the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> only because you said it twice, I'm going to point out it's hyperbole. <laughs> Give him a break. He's uh, like, he is a multi-language guy, right? <laughs> French yeah, and German. I mean, I, I, his French I'm talking and about German humility. So much I, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. yeah I'm not, on peut parler français aussi, ici. Ajouter un peu de langue. No, just kidding. No, I, I, used to, I, I, I used to make the same mistake with that word myself for years and years before I heard it actually used in conversation properly. For the first time, I was like, oh, hyperbole. Um, well, no, I used to I used to do it on purpose. I love hyperbole. It it, it does speak to uh, something grandiose, you know. Exactly. That's why I like, the that's why I, I like the idea of like, like exactly it's like Twitter is the hyperbole. You know, it's like Mad Max <laughs> beyond Thunderdome. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 maybe, yeah. It's a good it's a good analogy. But you know that that's the thing. You know, with uh, if you're not a native, I just know lots of words that I just know from reading, right? But I have n not the faintest idea how you pronounce them. <laughs> I'm I'm a native. Oh, yeah. the worst. That's how I. Oh, oh yeah, I, English. When it comes to Greek, when it comes to pronouncing Greek, like classical, like I, I've read a lot of like classical uh, Greek uh, English transcriptions of things, translations, and it's just sort of like I know that I'm gonna fuck up some of these words or a lot of oh, them. Oh yeah. Um, but that's the danger of speaking time, in a language that you don't comprehend. I thought I thought Odysseus's wife was named Pe Penelope. Um, <laughs> And like I would run into that that name also in like I don't know like Western novels where like the pretty girl in town would be named Penelope, and I would always think like, man, Penelope is a really like that doesn't not like sound like an attractive woman. It's like there was like Bertha or something, you know. It just doesn't paint. And then it was like, oh, Penelope. And I was like, oh, that actually does sound really. Nice. I, I believe that, actually, you know, like <laughs> rhetoric. I just recently learned that you read you rhetoric. You pronounce rhetoric. I already thought it's like rhetoric because <laughs> that's how we pronounce it in German. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not so far off. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. 
But I, I mean, it's, it's definitely it, it's the autodidact problem in English because our pronunciation rules are so nonsensical. It varies uh, from country to country too. Yeah. If anything will teach you epistemic humility, yeah. it is it is the pronunciation rules okay. in English. So it's like, are you sure you know the correct pronunciation? I, I asked some <laughs> a native speaker the other day, and like, um, I mean, dude, just explain it to me once and for all. Is it either or either? Is it neither or neither? You know, and they say, oh no, uh, some people say like this, some like this. I don't yeah, know. It's both. <laughs> it's both. Yeah. It's the both. answer is yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. oh, just to get back. Exactly. Uh, all right, hold on a second. Let's talk about let's just to steer back to um something that John was talking about in um mimetic judo. So uh project bluebeam, right? Um, so this, this idea. And it's this idea that has been lingering in art for a very long time, which is a signal to me that it's some, there's something, if not prophetic about it, there's something, um, uh, I know Luke has written a lot about implicit knowledge of things. And, and, and we need to distinguish between this, you know, sort of explicit and implicit knowledge to some degree, um, because I think that 99% of our experience of reality is implicit. Uh, you know, it's sort of like when we talk about epistemic humility, it's like, well, what can I know in any given moment? Well, I know I'm podcasting right now. And I know that I, I have experience um, in the ways in which that happens. Like I know the basic mechanics of how that works, that one subsystem, that domain of reality. And so it's sort of like, but I can distinguish just having experience in something from like knowing the full truth of it. Um, uh, I think that that happens in every domain. Like it's sort of like I have reached the limits of my knowledge currently um, in this particular domain, I, or I'm reaching a gray area where I can say, ah, I kind of guess this rather than I know this rock solid. Um, and like that is a uh, it is a spectrum to some degree, but I do think like there is a line that gets crossed eventually. Um, and so like when with something like Project Bluebeam, it's sort of like, yes, I know that people will attempt that or are attempting that. I know that that will happen at some point because the artist reported it. You know, other artists are reporters of the future. Um, they reported COVID in many ways uh, for a very long time up until COVID happened. Um, so, yeah. So Project Bluebeam. So the so the alien invasion starts tomorrow. Right. We look up in the skies, we see all kinds of strange shapes and lights and colors uh, that we're not used to. And so there will be a panic and there will be reactive forces, just as there are in any given scenario where, um, you know, the, the world is upended or something like that. Um, and so that's a real test. Right. Like if we think about and so was COVID, but like, man, like Project Bluebeam would be a super duper test of our ability to hang back and observe, like not just think about things, but really look and observe reality and try to say, OK, what are the possibilities? Um, what aligns with what my implicit knowledge is of reality, uh, as opposed to like what I can know in some um, fashion in which, you know, in a scientific fashion, you're going to say, and what, what can I reproduce through experiment? Well, I can't, I can't know anything. I can't reproduce through experiment anything that's going on in the sky, even now. You know, it's just sort of like, what, what kept the plane up there? Well, I know some of the mechanics of it, but it's just sort of like, I don't know, like there's, there's, there are things that, um, you know, fluid dynamic dynamics of, of this entire system where it's just sort of like, okay, there's going to be gray areas where I'm like, um, which is why we investigate things like crashes and and, and, and accidents of all kinds, because it's just like, well, something went wrong with this system. We do not have total domain knowledge of this or that system. Uh, so if aliens uh, appear in the sky or some weird shapes appeared in the sky tomorrow, uh, my first instinct would be to like, let's let's see what transpires. Let's see how everyone else, how the system reshapes itself around this phenomenon. Right. Like to not look at the phenomenon itself, because that's beyond my domain. What is within my domain is my observation of how people react to it, how governments react to it, how economies react to it. You know, like those are all things within my, you know, domain of something that I can possibly know. Uh, and exactly, I think that yeah. if we apply that, yeah, if we apply that around, it's just sort of like well, the opposite of it is clear. Um, Yuval Harari, like I think a couple of months ago, earlier this year, 
he had said something along the lines of, um, this is during the chatbot hysteria. Um, and he said something along the lines of, I want a chatbot to write a holy book. That's actually true. In other words, the chatbot will will unify all of the religions into something that's true and like obviously true. And I'm just sort of like that is there would be the opposite. There would be the opposite of of saying of, of looking at something that you clearly know nothing about and saying like, oh, OK, we will derive, we will divine the answer from this because um, uh, the system that underlies it is something that um, dovetails with my implicit knowledge about reality. So this is a man who is on the brink of madness or actually probably crossed the line long ago. Um, someone who, you know, who's hubris about his, what he thinks he knows about reality, about the human condition, um, about, uh, you know, God almost. Um, and it's, it, that's quite a different thing than say um, the implicit knowledge that I would say like, okay, well, there is a God or at least a first cause or some sort of demiurge, something, you know, to trace back through time and say like, well, Reality has a source. That's quite a bit different than claiming to know the mind of God. Like that's where the line gets crossed. Yeah, like I, yeah. I've I've traveled from like I know that there is a cause for this. I know that there is a source for life. Um, and the say claiming to say like, and I know perfectly well, you know what that source is and how it operates. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say, you know, like at some point, this idea what I talked about. Uh, before like of like bringing your direct experience into it you know like it, it breaks down to some extent right i mean because uh you might end up when it comes to metaphysical questions you might end up with sam harris oh i can't see heaven you know with a telescope kind of thing so therefore it doesn't exist uh, so i mean that's uh that's very true i mean at some point you gotta think deeper and i think there are different levels to it like for the ufo thing i think you're exactly right mark uh i mean it, it just because we don't see it every day or not see it at all you know depending on on your experiences um might not actually mean you know like that you can just dismiss it because you can actually infer from like as you said how people react to it right so if you read like uh, richard dolan's uh ufos in the security state i think was was the w the book um where it basically traces like uh how the the intelligence agencies and the government agencies and all of these guys how they like uh, the air force whatever you know like took it super seriously like for forever you know and 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 uh and documented all that and talked about it and and you can kind of infer you know like i mean these guys that they, they are not just you know like making the shit up or just crazy right i mean it's just they there's a long history of like it's uh super dense uh, documents and and conversations about about that so that that's the first thing right and when it comes to metaphysics i mean that there's like that it really gets fuzzy, I think, because um, I'm still convinced, you know, that experience is kind of like at the root of stuff, even in philosophy, you know, you, but it it might be like a very a, a subtler form of experience. It might even be just a, you know, like a taste for an intuition for truth, uh, for like what's really going on, you know, or um, even like, you know, when you hear like uh, bio biological arguments about like how we are all tribal and stuff, um, I think that's also a very important aspect, by the way, um, uh, when we, when it comes to this epistemic humility, because we're all tribal, you know, and we we think in, in, in you know, self-interest and status. And so evolutionary psychology has something to say about that for sure, you know, I mean, that's a, a big trap. But we also know from experience that we're not just that, right? So though there's a there's other layers of experience as well. There's other behavior. There's there's other impulses within us. So uh, we can kind of infer from that that you know we're not just biological machines, uh, for example. You know, so so there there again there, there comes this sort of experience into it, but it's like a very different sort of experience, and it also can go wrong. You know, it's 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 much more. It's very fragile because you you can uh, have your blind spots. You know, like your uh, belief systems that uh, that just uh, are in the way you know and, and even just your biological as i said you know like impulses and uh, uh, for example it's like a, a phenomenon I, I talked to this a little bit with grant uh, before before he had to go unfortunately um, like even like in in online discourse right you, you can see how there's a huge incentive of like 
uh, differentiating your group like from the rest uh, you know and, and and i can see that in the dissident right discourse as well because if, uh, interestingly like there's a there's a massive incentive right to differentiate yourself from the mainstream right because you can get anywhere like with mainstream right talking point right within the dissident right so th there's just these these tribal things you know and um, that doesn't obviously mean that you know like something can be true you know if you differentiate yourself so uh, but you, we just got to keep in mind these things that can stand in in the way basically of of, of truth and uh, but yeah so um i was just gonna say um uh, when it comes to metaphysics and and the more hidden reality kind of things it all gets gets a bit more subtle and you certainly cannot like show a bunch of stats you know like to make your point or just refer to like a telescope you know where, where you either can see heaven or you don't you know that kind of thing so so th that's a really an, an, an another game a different game so to see you brought up luke um something that was interesting i, I mean because earlier john had said you know i he didn't want to say iq but you know as far as what to refer to and, and that aspect of group membership is i think the, the dimension that you know maybe there's some correlation with intelligence but it's it's a weak one and the you know you think of um when your identity is not as a seeker of truth per se wherever the search leads but your identity is as say as a contrarian knower of forbidden facts or about the world you know and then it's like, kind of like well if the mainstream narrative shifts you got to to preserve your identity is I'm a contrarian knower of forbidden esoteric facts, you know, or countercultural facts. Like you got to suddenly shift your own, you know, falling right into the mimetic judo trap that John Carter said. It does seem to come down to identity, like how you identify with, you know, the, uh, the subject matter, but also your, your, what you need to signal to your fellow tribe members that, Hey, I'm a member in good standing of this tribe you know um so anyway it's just like and then also um a reflexive movement that happens that uh, you know i've experienced it, it as, as well as like when you feel like you've you've believed a you know a narrative or i guess a narrative for lack of a better term about the world like this is the way the world works this is how you navigate it this is how you get the things that you know you get good results by you know, applying these principles, that kind of thing, um, you know, set of explanations, a set of like just a lay of the land um, general map about the way the world works. And then when you realize there's, that is flawed, you know, okay, so there's some maybe some cognitive dissonance that comes in, but if the map is still generally useful for the most part, but there's this like specific area over here, like I had a GPS back in the early days of GPS that certain towns it would just get it completely wrong, take me to the wrong place or whatever. But generally it was good. So I didn't ditch it. You know, I just knew, you know, kind of like double check it sometimes if I'm in an unfamiliar area. But, um, but you know, if that happens often enough and you start to say, okay, well, obviously this isn't working anymore. The, the landscape has changed, especially if the situation's dynamic. And then, uh, you know, there's this narrative collapse that occurs. And then when you have that happen, I mean, it's like a person coming out of a, a childhood re religion where, you know, the religious explanation, it, it, it just comes up against reality more and more until they're like, all right, this is, doesn't seem to be correct. And then there's this crisis where they, you know, where the, the, the impulse is to seek, okay, I, this, you don't want to be without a map in this world where, you know, it's constantly things are changing and the battle lines are, you know, vary from month to month. So you, you find that somebody else that has a map that they could kind of give you you know, and, and you, you know, maybe you go in the opposite direction, but it's like, that's, you know, a lot of times you, I've learned the hard way after enough of those times, like not to seek the other map that's ready made. And it's like, here's all the answers, you know, but, um, but that's just that aspect of it, that group dynamic and the, the identification with a set of answers, a narrative, a community that coalesces around that narrative, you know, and then, People that, that seems to explain a lot of why people react the way they do, and it it, it, it does, and it I also agree. points to like it also points to like the danger of um sort of affinity groups based on belief, 
because then like, once you have that, the belief, whatever it is, or the, the set of beliefs uh, more commonly, it's, it, they're no longer truth propositions that are, that are open to any sort of reality testing, right? Because it's now like, you know, we are the group of people who believe X. Okay, well, then if you stop believing X, you can't be part of our group anymore. So you're right, right? And like, you know, uh, most uh, of, the, I mean, the Abrahamic religions definitely fall into that kind of category. Um, but then so do many of the ideological descendants of Abrahamism, such as, you know, communism or, or liberalism. Uh, and, you know, certainly we see that uh, very strongly with uh, the kind of woke phenomenon where, you know, they just have all these very silly things that they believe that you cannot question uh, or you're out, you're canceled. Um, but... Uh, if somebody I, I gives think you he, their position on gun control, you can predict their position on abortion, on everything climate else. change, right. transgender, yeah, like right. a whole list of things then, that have nothing to do I with mean, gun control. Like, but then, right, but then, and, then, and then, I, I think it's, it's a like, little like, unfair like, to just say like, Abrahamic religions. I mean, we're, we're talking about all religions at this point, because uh, all religions have their no. heretics, their apostates, no, their no, infidels. No, actually, I, I, I kind of disagree, um, because I don't think that the folk religions is kind of more organic uh pagan faiths of the pre-christian era had the same sort of exclusivity about them. all right well we that agree to disagree on that one i mean maybe that's a separate discussion but but I, but i do agree with the base point of what you were saying john which is and also daniel this is a map territory problem and it always has been and it's and maybe Daniel, I think, very well described like the problems with map, because the problems with map are someone will draw you a map, whether it is a philosophical map, whether it is a religious map, a uh, scientific, quote unquote, map. Um, but people are always looking for that because we are sort of, for the most part, wandering around in in darkness. Um, and so I think that when you drill back into like, let's say, religions that are illuminative, that are specifically about um, saying like, okay, so you are in darkness. You do not have a map. Um, here is a map. Here is a flashlight to look at the map. It's not the same as experiencing the territory. And the territory, I think, is more that implicit knowledge. And I know that like, you know, a lot of people will say like, well, that's the right hemisphere. That's the that's the connecting of the dots that happens without any explicit um, uh, knowledge that can be, you know, testable in any way, right? Like, like that would be the consciousness problem. In other words, it's just sort of like we all experience each other as conscious beings. We this is a belief that we have. I don't think that it quite qualifies as a belief. I think that's more territory type experience, right? Like, you know, like the four of us here are generally. Right, right. This is this is oh, yeah. us in the territory. I I understand that John is a person, Dan's person, Luke's person. Uh, I'm a person, hopefully, but like we <laughs> do look at the problem that way. Like, but we don't really. It's not it's not something that we discuss because it's it's sort of like it's beneath discussion, you know. And 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 so when we look at things like the the sort of the the wackiness of the you know gender ideology and all of the the um associated madnesses and 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 problems that stem off of um what is essentially a denial of the territory not of any specific map you know like i think there are problems like that where it's just sort of like oh it's just i'm just denying that i'm here i'm denying that you're a person who's who is a, who has consciousness and a soul um i'm denying that uh that that the conversations that we're having are rooted in anything real. They're all just mechanical manifestations or epiphenomenon of, of some kind of electrical um, uh, death trap. That That is a, an assumption. And that would be more akin to a belief, I would think. And, like, and I think beliefs are um, what maps generate, right? They don't generate truth. They generate beliefs um, and belief systems. And like those could be anything. You know, I mean, John said like the pagan um, um, beliefs as well, and I, you've written uh, well about that. Like, I, I I had a lot to say actually about um, the concept, the Norse concept of Ragnarok, and of um, and and of also the uh, of Valhalla and like what they're doing there. 
the idea so just that, to, like, just well, to, just to yeah, quickly yeah. comment on that again, like, yeah. um, I think the distinction uh, that I was trying to make is that, um, you know, say like you were like a Roman or a Greek or something, right? And like, okay, so your culture has these various beliefs, uh, stories, really, more accurately about, you know, the gods. And, you know, you can kind of believe them or disbelieve them, take them at face value or not, but doing one or the other didn't sort of define you as a member of their community, but defined you as, you know, an Athenian was the fact Vikings? that you were... But you had, well, I mean, you had a certain Vikings? set that you had. I, 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 I disagree. Yeah, I disagree like, strongly with that. But I'm, but I'm, yeah, I would have executed hold on, hold on, hold on. And other philosophers were either exiled hold or executed. On, hold on, hold on. You hold know. on. Anytime anyone that brings up paganism, it's like, oh, the Vikings. So I'm like, okay, but like, I'm not, I wasn't talking about that. Uh, I, that's why I said, like, you know, what defines you as like, an Athenian, for example, was um, not uh, what you believed, it was who you were descended from. Um, and secondarily, kind of where you lived, right? Similarly with the Roman, it's like, you know, descent and uh, to a certain degree adoption, um, like you could become a citizen, uh, but it, it, your belief in Zeus was not like an element of that, right? Like it wasn't a, a culture of belief or a, a community of belief in the same way. Whereas, um, you know, if you as a Christian sort of deny the Trinity or, uh, transubstantiation or or sort of any particular doctrine that that's your heritage and right you know um don't you have i mean you, you, maybe it's not so a particular uh, belief right. about so Jews, I, I, but I, I, a belief I, in I, something like i mean socrates ran afoul of and uh, you know others too to get exiled or or you know it, maybe the the narrative you, can you know, whatever the structure far. was can, didn't rely always... on a particular belief about zeus but they believe you know relied on some kind of narrative that right. If you it depends on it too it, much. You'd be in trouble. You can, it also you depends on what part to... of Hellenistic Greece you're talking about, because there were different sure. there were different eras, and towards yep. the end, like it absolutely collapsed into cults. It absolutely that's where we get the word cult, like the hero cults of late stage Greece, certainly yep. collapsed into something like uh, you are a heretic if you don't make the proper sacrifices to this or that god. Like that, as far as I know of history, and I, you know what I think of history, John, but as far as what I know of history, that that if we, I am to accept what is um, what what has been recovered from the past, then like that's part of it. So like maybe so, what we're talking about is that there's an there's so an to urge be, to there. Let, let me be let me be more abstract and hopefully more specific. So it's sort of like the distinction between a community that has beliefs and a community that is defined by beliefs. Right? I mean, like, every community is going to have things that are generally believed by people in that community that, you know, you can sort of identify, you sort of say, oh, people, who, if they're in that community, they probably believe this, and if you find out that they believe that, it's like, oh, they might be, a, it's, they're more likely part of that community. Um, like, every tribe, every culture is always been a that. But you also have, you know, the really hardcore cults. But it's like the what defines your your membership in the community is is whether or not you believe something. And in that second case where the belief attains primacy, um, it becomes extremely difficult to question it. Like it gets yeah. put outside of the, the epistemological bound because now, like, if you question it, like. You're, an you attack on out. the community. It's yeah, an attack I, on the community, you, and you get kicked out of the community, right? So no one will do it. I think that there might be like a, a a sort of meta thing to this. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about what uh, Simone Weil, not the French feminist, but the French mystic, uh, said about it, and she um used uh, like Rome and Israel, you know, like in as a sort of stand-ins, like for for two tendencies in a society um like late stage rome where like basically it's total materialist mayhem right everything falls apart and the proverbial uh degeneracy um and all of that and israel is a sort of like th hardcore theocracy you know that kind of like micromanages every everything every people's move um it's like this uh, hardcore belief uh, slash power 
thing, right? Uh, so, I mean, that's just the ar archetypical um, stories that she used to to show that that contrast, and that there seems to be something, you know, of a, of an oscillation going on between these two, some sort of dialectic, right, where like one kind of follows the other, and um, and I think that. You know, for me, the way I see it is that there's sort of two kinds of religions, in a sense, or ways of of um, looking at religion. And and one is like, if you will, like the true spiritual impulse of, uh, you know, like tran tran transcendent experience, uh, soul development, you know, like growing towards God and, and all of that. It's a very individual thing and it can manifest in in different ways and has manifested in different ways uh, historically right and then there's also like religion as a necessary uh, power structure or belief structure that holds society together right and, and every society has something like that um so I, it, like i'm not like arguing like for either like the position that christianity or the abrahamic religion are like fundamentally different than some of the pagan ones or the other way around you know i'm just making a general point that you always have these two aspects and and one aspect will always be um holding society together like sanctioning dissenters um that sort of thing it will always exist you know whether it manifests in um in like more diehard like um, as we know it, like from from the Jewish and Christian uh, religions, like uh, commandments and uh, and things like that, or like a belief sets of belief you have to subscribe to, or it's like a, a bit different, where you basically have uh, it's more like directly rules based, you know, like for a society, a certain structure that is still considered in a sense divine, right? Um, but it's more maybe like. Um, uh, about uh, bloodlines or like territory or something like that but there's still a connection to you know to to religion and uh and and these are just different ways of like basically keeping the flock uh you know together and you you always have that and and i think it's important to think about these things in in different ways and uh, because there's there's also like the true you know sp spiritual impulse um that kind of transcends this sort of outer structure um but there's also this outer structure, you know, which is just um, authoritarian in a sense, but also necessary. And then people will realize, oh, that's too authoritarian, you know, and, and they just want to prescribe beliefs and blah, blah, blah. And then it will gradually shift and, and at the end of the day, like degenerate, you know, and, and there's this sort of dialectic uh, that seems to be good. That's the way I think well, about it anyway. Well, like if you look at if you look I at think the, the, I the think etymology... The if you look at the etymology of religion, right? Religio reconnects, which is the Romans just thought of it as like, you know, the set of sort of traditions that you use to like, you know, connect yourself to the ancestors, to uh, to connect society together. Like, um, I don't necessarily think that's authoritarian or like a control structure, but it certainly does help to maintain societal coherence, right? And then like, but then like you the example of, so then the example of like late stage Rome, is what happens when that when that disappears entirely and there's no more coherence and society unravels and then the example of like late stage israel kind of the the, the roman jewish wars era in the first century um well that that's what happens when your uh structure becomes this ossified authoritarian theocracy that removes all sort of flexibility from society and that is a fail. That, that is also a fail. Like now, um, well, I, you, know, you get. I think that's that's why failure. Daniel's map. Yeah, I think that's why Daniel's map analogy is so good, because again, a map can lead you in a bunch of different directions. Like it's sort of like what Luke was saying about um, that that religion is something that binds society together. Okay, some to some degree it can be glue, but it could also bound to purpose people. And so there's a difference between like sort of binding like like a, and like again, like with respect for ancestors and for history and for bloodlines, that's all part of it. But it's it's one por portion of the map. There are other also edges to that map and like and, and, and religion can also bind to purpose. And so like the, what I was trying to get at, I wasn't trying to, um, um, di you know, I wasn't trying to diss the Vikings. What I actually thought it was very interesting. Um, the the uh, ever since I was a kid and read about them, I thought that the concept of Valhalla and and what and what awaited them there 
was actually quite fascinating in terms of an afterlife concepts, right? Because like, again, it's sort of like, well, everything's a training ground for the next war. It's that's completely, the, that's the, it's that's completely, as far as I'm able to tell, it's totally well, huge. Um, and like, as, yeah, is like the, the, as is like the nine worlds system of like Yggdrasil, like a, of the world tree, like they've never come across anything right. kind of similar to that. Yeah. But what it, what, it, what it did is, is, is in addition to m- maybe there was some social glue there and you could argue that there was, but like what it mostly did was bind to purpose in the same way that, and I don't think it's entirely unique because I think you could see something in the jihadi um, uh, uh, philosophy in there as well. 100%, like this is not something 100%. that's com- completely yeah. unique. So it's like 100%. the edges of the map yeah. and it's like our, our bound purpose is to expand that map. So how do we do that? Okay, so we have a religion now that says, like, go die gloriously in battle, because guess what? That's not even the end. You're going to have another battle after that, another battle, a battle every day until the next, until the final battle. So in other words, it it, it places the sort of the, the imperium of reality in like one little box here and says there are other boxes and they are similar in shape. But like, first you need to deal with this box, the the edges of this map, and then we'll, and that's a training ground and a proving ground for the next map and the next map and the next map, the next iteration or fractal uh, version of this reality. And so like, and on and on until again, ultimately there's an end to the story. And that's the interesting part is that no matter what religion um, you, you investigate, you'll always see that there is a story for the most part. I won't say every single one, but like there, for the most part, what we're saying is there's a beginning, middle and an end. And like, we're either at the beginning or the middle. And, um, and the Vikings, what they did by like binding to purpose through their religious, um, uh, uh, iconography. And, and I, I would say like, not even, we're not talking about metaphor here. Like the Vikings, I believe the reason that they were so such fierce warriors is because they believed this. They absolutely believe that that's how you get berserkers. That's how you get um, the type of uh, soldiers that will gladly fling themselves into the most, the, the yes, highest and, degree of danger. And you're, because and you're completely correct. Like the jihadis like of like the 10th yeah. century, it was the same thing, right? They believed they would go to And of the 21st century. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's. I, I just read, you know, like even in the 19, uh, end of the 19th, big, early 20th century, like even in Germany, like people like c- trace their families back to the Crusades, right? Um, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> uh, even like if it was often made up, you know, but it shows that it's like uh, how important that kind of purpose thing uh, still was not so long ago, you know, even in the Christian context. So so this idea of purpose binding, um, I don't think... The right metaphor necessarily is map. So you know, if you think about okay, na- like navigation, right? Uh, okay, so you want your map, um, but it also helps to have your orientation. You need a compass, you know. So you have like something that points you in the direction of like using an invisible field that can't be seen with your eyes, but tells you the right way to go, even if you don't necessarily know where exactly you are on the map, but you know at least the direction to head in, right? Uh, But then, of course, the third element of that is um, what you can see with your eyes, right? So, like, you know, you've got your your astrolab and your sextant, so you can see, see like, um, what... How, how far Polaris is above the uh, above the horizon and get your your latitude and like you know you you look at like landmarks and try to like match them to what you see on on the map that you have and you have to have to kind of like use all of these elements you know use your looking at reality itself uh your model of reality um uh, and your internal orientation towards that which is not visible and the th- if you use the three of them well you can navigate reality quite effectively um but to use the three of them well you also have to be a bit skeptical of all three of them is okay your compass says go in this direction but is your compass actually properly right you know uh your um observations suggest that you know you're on this part of the map but are you sure you did the observations correctly are you sure and do you actually trust them is, is your map accurate? 
or is it out of date or is it just is there some made up stuff in the back that's never actually existing with that? and so you, you you can't totally you can't have blind trust in any three of them you have to kind of like mutually check them back and forth continuously and if you do that you can navigate and if you're not doing that eventually you're going to get lost but but, but that's a john that's a very enlightened view of uh, religion and i think that's what i meant you know when when i said uh, like something about like the you know like the true spiritual impulse or something like that you know when you when you really um use all these things to to bind yourself to a purpose but also um like constantly like uh observe and and adjust course and also are in touch with the invisible you know guidance and and all of that and that's really what what i think you know religion is about and and there are, there's different you can manifest that in different ways in different religions you know like deal with it in in different ways so to say but there's also um, and you can and you can see people who go too far in one direction or the other. yeah exactly so and, like, and, you're like you're like religious fundamentalist type uh, yeah, and, and, or and that's, almost almost equivalently your your scientism type. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. They will go way too far in like just like oh, uh, I, it, I, and, I this map is perfectly true and and it's not it's not even like too going too far. Your, I think that there's there's like a fundamental you know like there's two roles basically as I said before you know just think of like you know like something like a, a rule that you had in Christianity for a long time. Basically, you're not allowed to divorce, right? So. Um, so that's uh, kind of like a very broad map, you know, if you will, like a very low resolution map. And uh, it is kind of uh, necessary or like or also people thought, you know, for a long time for for a society to have that rule, you know, just to um, it's, a, it's a it's in a sense, it's a technique. It's a it's a social technology, right, to to, to hold society together and, and you know, manage it. Uh, but you know what you will always like um go against or like come in, uh, encounter a circumstance where the rule just doesn't apply right so and and the catholic church you know knows had some ways of dealing with that you know when there's like uh, abuse and stuff you know but but still it's very hard because often abuse you know like uh, one way or the other is isn't like physical and and sometimes you just get have to get the hell out of a, of a marriage right it's just just a fact of life and uh, so that you you can see that um uh the, the, so, sort of sometimes rules... sometimes you just haven't got a male heir and you need to you need to roll the dice again with a different woman yeah i mean it's just henry the eighth <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and so but my point is you know like um you have these two aspects of religion um, and this sort of enlightened way to see it uh, that you guys described, I think that's 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 the crux of the matter, right? But um, but then you have also this this societal function, and and I think um, a lot of uh, confusion comes from that because you you see like these these religions, and they have kind of these two faces, like there's just this Janus faced thing, you know. On the one hand, you have this true enlightenment, so to say, you know, like with the jihad, you know, like the jihad can be like something something very enlightened you know but it can also be like this crazy rule that is just you know like uh uh cr absolutely bonkers you know and 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 you have these issues and and that's i think why some of the discourse around religion is so is so difficult you know because these two aspects that it, it's like they they you you bash the the one aspect you know like but you hit the other one as well and and it's all a big uh, big confusion right you know, um, I think that that's, that oh, relates back to the epistemic humility in the sense where, okay, so like one thing that isn't discussed um, often enough, I think, when we're talking about that is this idea of um, unified theories of things. So it's sort of like whether it's a unified theory of physics, whether it's a unified theory of of, of religion, of of, you know, a totalizing knowledge domain which is what everybody is kind of looking for in the same sense that they're looking for eternal life. Uh, these are things that we just do. You know, we don't, we, 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 we examine later why we did them and it results in trillions and trillions and trillions of words um, in order to try to describe what we're actually in search of, what we're actually looking for. And so like we go on these quests and like, you know, just to take the unified, um, uh, a unified uh, physical model of reality, as one as one um, sort of pursuit, 
it's sort of like, okay, so when I'm approaching physics and I'm not a, phys- I'm not a physicist or anything like one, I'm, 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 I suck at math. Um, but uh, if I was to look at it from that perspective, and I have tried to look at it from that perspective, it's sort of like we have a domain that looks like something that maybe we could wrap our hands around and our minds around. Um, but we're not in the territory. We're still drawing the map. We're still making the model. Um, we're pretending that like this is something that can be known fully. Um, and like I think that the ultimate epistemic humility is to realize that nothing nothing can be known fully you know and if you don't if you, if that's the underlying assumption for reality is that like i am a participant in it i am on the stage but i cannot be in the audience at least not in physical form i cannot i cannot observe the thing from the outside of it because i am in it i am a part of it um and 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 i think that most misadventures on that map come from you know, I hate to go back to Gilgamesh, but like, it's sort of, well, that's not true. I love to go back to Gilgamesh, but, uh, but like, um, you know, in that fashion, like when he meets the immortal man, finally, the man who has conquered or, or, or has in some way has become immortal, although that's remains mysterious, right? Because of course he knows the truth. No, no one is immortal. Nothing is immortal. He could be, you know, he could be, be hit by a bus tomorrow. Um, once we get to that stage where we say nothing is certain, I cannot know anything fully, and I am mortal. I think that that sort of like when John was talking about like, well, you have to have a compass, not just a map, but a compass, but also an awareness and an observation capability of of, of the actual territory. Like I think, I think what he's describing is something like that position. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but like, I think it's something along those lines where it's just sort of like, if you can start with the assumptions that I can't know anything completely, I am necessarily a part of reality. Um, uh, and so therefore I am on the stage, not outside of it. Um, the best that I can do is to develop my experience in multiple domains and, and, and seek a purpose that, um, in my mind, uh, furthers life furthers the force of life. And I would say the force of God, um, the will of God, like to serve the will of God would be to serve, to, to serve in a capacity that will help to increase life intelligence, um, and, and love throughout the universe. And like, but I can't know it for sure. I can't know any part of that for sure. Right. Yeah. And like, I mean, part part of what I was saying is that you know, it's like that like purpose you're serving, right? That would be like your compass lead, um, what, what you're trying to use to to bind you to uh, a certain direction um, to maintain an orientation. But part of the humility is acknowledging that like y- you might not be aligned. Like a, you might not be aligned to the correct thing. Maybe that's actually not the ideal. Like maybe trying to increase love in the universe has really perverse effects. You aren't haven't been wise enough or smart enough to think about, it, right? Um, or maybe you think you're aligned to that, but actually you've inadvertently gotten knocked off alignment and uh, are therefore heading in completely the wrong direction without even realizing. Um, and like, I mean, you shouldn't let yourself be paralyzed by that. You don't want to be like, you know, like in analysis paralysis where you're, you're too epistemically humble to ever do anything. But uh, you, you sort of have to be checking that kind of thing constantly. And like, that's, so I'm sort, of, I'm sort of like thinking in terms of like just like constantly checking your instruments, right? And like, just like, you know, just doing the circuit of all of them. And like, is this working? Is this working? Is this working? You know, and like, and rather than relying wholly on any one thing, um, and just trusting it blindly, you sort of spread the trust, as it were, uh, throughout as many different instruments and modalities as you can. And then, like, hopefully, like, the, the sort of sum total of all of them will um, keep you from going too far astray and help you go, help you to get where you actually want to be. But that's where a North Star comes into um, play, right? Because yeah, yeah, there's the sure, map, sure. there's the compass, yeah, yeah. there's the territory, yeah. and then yeah. there's the North Star. 
um, right. which is, of course, you know, central to the story of the birth of Jesus. And there's a reason for that, because, because there's a reason for everything well, yeah. uh, um, I mean, related like to maybe Christ or, and his story. Or, I mean, or 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 it was like a supernova. Or, I mean, there's a lot of different theories. Of You're right, exactly. But the concept, the concept of like, there's a sign in the sky. It's not on the ground. It's not in the map. It's not on the territory. I Correct. can't draw it's not, with my compass. It's, it, it's not in. It's not inside you. It's something outside of you. Yeah. You're looking at in in reality, right? Yeah. Um, right. Exactly. So yeah, and 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 but, I. Yeah. And I agree with you that it's like it's something that appeared. Like in other words, it wasn't even in astro uh, astrological charts. So, like, what they were, what that story right. tells us is that there was something that happened that is not mappable, and people followed it. They right. followed it to its yes. source, and yes. that source and was to, light. It was and like, illumination, and, and, and that's kind of like a deep idea in the whole idea in the whole whole concept of um, um, divination, right? Where you're constantly trying to like read the signs in reality, the way like a hunter will look at the spore and the tracks on the ground as he's trying to track down his prey with these kinds of things that appear in reality that are sort of very temporal uh that can't possibly be included in the map because they're here today and gone tomorrow and you can't predict when they're going to appear you know and you just have to right. a, comment, you a sign in and, the sky and, yeah. right and you can't even predict what will appear necessarily like things might happen that like you know there's no precedent for in any anything that you have to refer to uh and you have to be kind of like open to that and ready to kind of incorporate that and sort of try to read it you know um and i but i just one of the things i was trying to get up for in terms of like going too far in any one of them is like it's it's if you just put all of your trust in one of them i mean like so you have your religious fundamentalist who says okay like this holy book is totally true and that's the only thing that can be trusted you know and then you have maybe uh, someone who's a bit too much of a, uh, a mystic. And it's just like, I only listen to my inner voice. And then they turn into a schizoid, right? Um, or then you have like your sort of hard-nosed empiricist who says, I only read the book of nature and there is no higher reality. There is no compass needle to follow. And, uh, and no map can be trusted. And, you know, these people end up getting lost in trivia and unable to distinguish like what is important isn't what is not and like they they go completely off the rails as well um and it's just it's it's so it's it's so important to like sort of hold each of those three sort of equivalently important i would say and not to like privilege one or not to become so unbalanced that you're only listening to one or you're primarily listening to one and ignoring everything else yeah and a lot of the, and a lot of the times actually to, to bring this back to like the very beginning of the conversation with uh when you were sort of discuss, talking about the 60 meters right and like that kind of like oscillation you get in history uh through a kind of pure reaction i think one of the things that happens is that a society will in a certain mood at a certain time sort of lean too heavily into the map or into the territory or into the compass needle and that then produces certain pathologies, which the people who sort of deal with those pathologies, um, then they react to by saying, you know, so for instance, if you give an ossified society where it's like the map is all that matters, uh, and you have to follow it no matter what, and then the people that come along and say, well, actually, like that map is bullshit, and my my inner voice is telling me that's not the right way, and you should always listen to your inner voice, and you should never listen to the map, right? And then you know, they end up walking off a cliff somewhere because the inner voice says, head northeast, and they head northeast, and they don't realize, actually, yeah, they should have made a detour for a bit because they're, they're, there was a chasm that they walked right in. Um, yeah, yeah, you think you put it very well, John, um, and uh, maybe to, um, to close off uh, and uh, bring bring it all around, I mean, you already kind of did, did that, uh, John, um, now to the very beginning um i want to use like mark's analogy of the of the theater stage right and um uh, the way i see it uh, just to put it in slightly different words um is uh, basically um we we cannot get to the audience level right and just see the whole thing right um but we still have to move on the stage uh and uh, so i see it more like a dance uh, or if you like prefer uh 
you're more like the the martial type, maybe a sword fight or something like that, right? Um, where you basically, um, you have to move and to move, you have to adopt a certain position, a certain belief in a sense, right? Like you, you have to, um, let's say you, you have to evade one sword, you know, like hit, then you, you go like in the religious direction, you, you adopt the religious perspective, uh, and move like, like a few meters, uh, or, inches or whatever you savages use as, uh, <laughs> as measuring units um and uh, then you you know like then there's but the situation changed and suddenly you adapt the materialist scientist kind of mindset you know and use that you move like in a different direction and and, and then um but if you keep on moving you eventually like will fall off the stage right and die um so you gotta have to 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 play along you to with reality you know and 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 do this kind of dance uh, gracefully and uh, and not like become a fundamentalist and say oh the science it's all you know it's all stupid i'm a mystic all i need to do is like uh, listen to my angel voice you know inside and or you go the other extreme and and all that you you have but you have to move you cannot move in this reality without you know like adopting certain perspectives and you must choose carefully and and appropriately in in each situation and and that's kind of like what life demands of us and 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 this also ties in with the lodestar concept right i mean it's just um it's just not you the, the lodestar is not like a fixed star you know where you can just point to it and say okay just i just go straight at it right that seem, doesn't seem how it works you know it's more something that um, that is implicit, you know, that you you can seek and and follow, but it might it might uh, pull you in in different directions as well, you know, and and so this this whole this kind of a dance and sword fight kind of thing, and uh, and I think that way we can um, avoid um, you know that there's the sort of traps that that are there, or at least you know maybe history moves in in this dialectic, and there's just nothing we can do about, it, right? If maybe we just move from you know, like lunacy, uh, materialism, craziness, degeneracy to like theocracy, uh, like, you know, and, and this is just how it goes. You know, I don't know. Um, but even if that's the case, you know, then, then uh, at least we can like learn to do that kind of dance, you know, and even have fun of fun with it, you know, I mean, and, and move closer to our lodestar. Uh, or to God, you know, and uh, and maybe that's 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 enough, you know, but uh, yeah. So there's sort of this, there's sort of this like perennial idea that like the, the purpose of history is ultimately to stop the wheel of history and and uh, find some kind of like eternal balance, right? But then I wonder, is that really it, or is it more like the universe is constantly trying to com fully explore the implications of things at any one time, both good and bad, and that inevitably there will be bad, which then causes the reaction, which causes new things that you know need to be explored fully to their implications and so on. Like that's actually the point. And you know, maybe if you did manage to have some kind of like perfectly balanced society, okay, well now this is a thing whose implications need to be fully explored. And then it turns out it actually does have bad implications having this fully balanced society. Like it's it's maybe too stable and gets ossified and it becomes just very boring. Like, I don't know. Um, but what, like, yeah, the uh, the ride could be the point, basically. I think so, yeah. I, I, just to add on to that point very quickly, because the, the Lodestar concept is something that I think I, I didn't fully explain. Um, what I don't, I don't mean that you just aim in a straight line for the no, North I know, Star, I know because you then yeah. you will you you will experience the Wiley Coyote effect of just marching off of a cliff. So to bring it all back together, you need the star, you need the map, you need the con the, the the compass, and you need your eyeballs and your ears in order to observe and and to and so in following that North Star, you still have to navigate the terrain to it. And guess what? You'll never reach it. As because if you follow a star in one a... direction, you're just going to come back around to oh, where no. you start. Mark, you smashed as, all, as, all our hopes here. <laughs> as, as, as an aside, it just occurred to me that if you follow the third star till night and go straight on until morning, that you will not actually go in a straight line. Correct. Uh, so the, the materialist <laughs> perspective actually is good for something, I guess. <laughs> well, that, right. was a, that, was a Peter, that was a Peter Pan reference. Ah, all right. Yes, yes. 
I was I wasn't sure if you savages in Germany have uh, have Peter Pan as a cultural uh, uh, phenomenon or not. Oh, we um, do, we do. Yeah, we do. I mean, yeah, that was like the quote, like how to get to Never Neverland, right? But then, like, also the elves in Tolkien, like what that was the thing that, that was kind of like their thing too. Is like they're they're sailing straight to, to to true west, which sort of I remember like in one of Lewis, I think it was like C.S. Lewis's space trilogy maybe where he talks about this, that they just kind of like sailed straight off the earth effectively. Um, with the true West was actually in orbit, or maybe that was like a review of an answer. I can't remember. Uh, it's because true West is not in four dimensional space. It's a, di it's right. a different di dimension that you're moving through, which is yes. how you would reach the North star. I imagine not right. across the map, but through a hole in space and time. Yes, you have to go into the warp where the warp demons will try to eat your soul unless uh, you have the protection of the uh, of the field too. That's why I carry laser guns, John. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Las guns aren't aren't much aren't much good against warp demons. Like, <laughs> all right, guys. So that's what my vorpal sword is for. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be before we descend into like cheesy Star Trek uh, territory here. Um, yeah, uh, let me call it a day. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, everybody for listening. Um, and we'll be back uh, probably next week, if not in two weeks or whenever. Stay tuned and uh, have a great day. See you soon.